a police officer by the name of John Parker who was assigned to protect him. Okay? He had a police officer by the name of John Parker there who was assigned to protect him. So at Ford's Theater, the person who would be guarding Lincoln's box would be John Parker of the Washington, D.C. Police Department. Well, at approximately 8.30 that night, the presidential party arrived at the theater. About 8.30 that night, the presidential party arrived at the theater. At 9.30, who shows up? John Wilkes Booth. He has a single-shot Derringer pistol and a hunting knife. That's what he brought with him, a single-shot Derringer pistol and a hunting knife. You're one and done with a single shot Derringer pistol, right? One and done. You better make sure you do it right. Well, when he got to Ford's Theater, Booth asked Edmund Spangler, who was, who was Edmund Spangler? Stagehand, who was there. He asked him to hold his horse. He gets off his horse at Ford's Theater, hands the reins to Edward Spangler, and says, will you hold my horse? Well, Spangler was working that night, so he couldn't stand there and hold Boo's horse. So he gave it to a young peanut vendor by the name of Joseph Burroughs and told him to hold this horse in the alley, which he did. So Spangler, who's working that night, can't stand there and hold Boo's horse. So he hands it to a little guy, a peanut vendor. The peanut vendor was somebody that sold peanuts outside the theater for people to eat Kind of like a concession stand, only all it was was peanuts. And Joseph Burroughs, a young peanut vendor, is the one that's going to hold Booth's horse during this event. Well, Booth didn't go straight into the theater when he parked his horse, so to speak. Where do you think he went? Calm his nerves a little. He went over to a nearby saloon and ordered a drink. And you could tell he was a little unnerved because his big, his usual drink was brandy, and what did he order instead? Whiskey. So that's a little bit of a sign that historians think that he might have been a little bit nervous because instead of ordering his usual brandy, he ordered whiskey, which actually surprised, I think, the bartender. Because, you know, Booth had been in there many times, probably didn't order a lot of whiskey. Well, Booth has his drink and arrives back at Ford's Theater at approximately 10.07 p.m. 10.07, he gets back to the theater after calming his nerves with a little whiskey. Well, John Parker, the guy that was you know, scheduled to watch Lincoln, basically just abandoned his post and found a more comfortable seat to watch the play performance because nothing was going on. I mean, this is different than it is now. You'd never leave your post as a Secret Service agent today, but in those days it was different. So he stayed there, and well, nothing's really going on, so he left his post and he went and found a seat because he wanted a more comfortable place to watch the play. That's what he did. So Lincoln's box, presidential box in Ford's Theater, is going to be left unguarded. Well, Booth enters the theater, he walks up the staircase, because you'll see this in Ford's Theater, the president sat up on a balcony kind of and looked down upon the play, and there was a staircase that went up to the box, the presidential box that he was sitting in, which had a red, white, and blue sash, and instead of the presidential seal, which wasn't invented, you know, if you see the president now, there's a presidential seal in front of him, wherever he speaks, guess what, the, what they had in front of the president in those days before they invented the presidential seal? They had a picture of someone who has the presidential seal. George Washington, very good. That was the presidential seal, okay? So Lincoln's up in this presidential box that's very well marked with a red, white, and blue sash, so to speak, with President Washington's picture as the seal, okay? Well, after entering the theater, Booth walked up the staircase toward the presidential box, and he entered a room just outside where the president was sitting. And you may get a chance to see this next year when we're there, depending on what they allow and not. But basically, you opened a door to get into a room where you opened a door to get to where the president was. Okay? Does that make sense? So Booth enters the room 
just outside the presidential box. So he's not standing in view of Lincoln, but right behind him, he's in the room between, okay? And he gets in that room, and he barricades the door with a wood bar so nobody can get in. And again, I hope you're picturing this. He's not, he's going to have to open up another door to get to where Lincoln is, but he barricades so nobody can get in. So obviously, he's not planning on going out the way that he came in, okay, because he barricaded the door. Well, he had this planned out because at approximately 10.15 p.m., our American cousin reached Act 3, Scene 2. That's right. What does that mean? Act 3, Scene 2. Well, third section of the play and like the second little cut scene. Right, yeah. So they're all planned out. He had this planned out. He knew the play. He knew it. And he waited until exactly when the play reached Act 3, Scene 2. Because he knew at this time in the performance that the actor on the stage, Harry Hawk, was going to perform the funniest line in the play, which was going to result in loud laughter. Okay? So this guy was not stupid. So he barricades the door shut with a wood bar, and at approximately 10.15 p.m., our American cousin reaches Act 3, Scene 2. And Harry Hawk performs the funniest line in the play. And 1,700 people in attendance at the play burst out in loud laughter after his point. This loud laughter is going to give Booth his opportunity he opens the door of the area that Lincoln was sitting in. He sticks his 45 caliber Derringer within inches of Lincoln's head and pulls the trigger. So the loud laughter gives Booth his opportunity. He opens up the area that will give him access to the president. He opens up that access, walks into the presidential box, and fires his 44 caliber single shot Derringer pistol within inches into the back of Lincoln's head. 44 or 45? 44. Okay. Yeah, it was a lot. But it's a big ball. Okay. The bullet lodged behind Lincoln's right eye. So it went in the back of his head and lodged in this area behind his right eye. And he immediately slumped over of the presidential, on the presidential box and lost consciousness immediately. So the bullet lodged behind Lincoln's right eye, and the president slumped over and lost consciousness. What's the first reaction by anybody in the presidential booth? Think about it. Booth standing right behind him. I mean, like right here. What's the first reaction? What, what action happens? Who's there? Who else? Major Rathbone immediately grabs Booth after the shot. And at that time, Booth dropped his Derringer on the floor, which you will see in Ford's museum next year. The Derringer is still in the theater. He drops his Derringer on the floor of the presidential box. Then what's Booth do as Rathburn grabs him? Pulls out his knife and slashes Major Rathbone's left arm between the shoulder and the elbow, quite severely. Booth slashes Major Rathbone. And if you know your history, what does Booth do after that? He, may, he begins to jump toward from the, uh, from the presidential box down to the stage. And according to history, Major Rathbone grabbed at Booth's coat as he jumped to prevent him and Booth caught his spur on the American flag that I talked about that was draped over the presidential box, which caused him to fall awkwardly onto the stage. So Booth shoots the president, Major Rathbone grabs Booth, Booth grabs his knife out and slashes Rathbone between the uh, shoulder and the elbow. Despite his injury, Rathbone grabs the back of Booth's coat or makes an attempt to as he's jumping off the stage, 
Booth catches his spur on the American flag that's draped over with Washington's picture and falls awkwardly about 12 feet to the stage and breaks his leg. Okay? And he's an actor, so what does he do? He stands up and faces the crowd of 1,700 and shouts, Sic Semper Tyrannus, which was a Latin phrase meaning, Thus always to tyrants. So as he falls and breaks his leg, he turns and faces the crowd of 1,700, as an actor I guess might, and yells out, Sic Semper Tyrannus, which was a Latin phrase meaning, Thus always to tyrants. While dragging his broken leg, he escapes through the back door of the stage, painfully mounts his horse, and rides off. <coughs> Meanwhile, back at the assassination site, Lincoln was immediately cared for by Dr. Charles Leo. He was immediately cared for by Dr. Charles Leo. And they laid the president on the floor of the presidential box, and at first, what did they check? They checked his torso and found what? Nothing. Nothing. And it wasn't until Dr. Leo rubbed his fingers through Lincoln's hair did he find the gap in his skull where the bullet had entered. And then it began to bleed profusely. Okay. So Dr. Leo laid the president on the floor, began searching for wounds, later rubbed his fingers through Lincoln's hair and found the gap in his skull where the bullet had entered. Three other doctors helped care for Lincoln while he was in the booth, all stating that the wound was mortal, meaning he's going to die. There's no saving. So three more doctors cared for Lincoln all knowing his wound was mortal. So, what's the next step? They're going to have to take him somewhere for him to what? Die. And where do you think they're going to take him? Where would it be the normal spot? Back to the White House, right? Well, the feeling it was clear that Lincoln wouldn't survive the trip back to the White House. So, as a result, they took him directly across the street from Ford's Theater to the second floor of the Peterson boarding house, which you will get a chance to see. So as a result, the president was taken directly across the street from Ford's Theater to the second floor of the Peterson boarding house. And what I'm going to do at this time, because you've been very good at taking notes, is I'm going to show you the first half of a video called Lincoln's Last Day, and we'll watch it up to the point that we've talked about. And then when we get back to class on Wednesday, and we'll continue this on the attempt to the assassinations, the other two, and what goes from there. So here we go. We will watch this. I think you'll enjoy it. Well, the last, Lincoln's last day. Will, if you could get the video for me, or the uh, light. Yeah, you wouldn't be laying in bed for the Hey, you know what? I'm going to tell you something, kids. Here's the good thing about history happening as we see it. You know when I recorded this? Day before yesterday it came out. So, very lucky. It's very good. I had not seen it before. You'll really like it. There'll be some things in here I didn't tell you. I want you to see if you can pick up on some of those. Here we go. A great man is reduced to memory. Objects that were kept warm in his pockets just hours before 
are ownerless. And you're going to see he some of these. That led to his last moments. Abraham Lincoln suspected nothing. The Civil War was ending. Robert E. Lee had surrendered. And Lincoln was looking forward to the rest of his life. They started planning the future. They were happy. But a band of Confederate sympathizers spent those same hours activating a deadly plot. Then fate steps in and takes it all from them. History was changed in an instant. They arrive late to the theater, and play begins, and then who is the story that everybody knows? But this story goes inside the tragedy. As the clock ticks down the last 24 hours of Lincoln's life. What happened on that fateful day? And what can we learn from the objects that survive? This is very good. I think you'll enjoy it. Morning, April 14th, 1865. In just 24 hours, the country will be plunged into unimaginable grief. But the day dawned bright and sunny. The nation was emerging from the bloody sacrifice of civil war. The war hung over Abraham Lincoln's presidency like a cloud. The problem of slavery was threatening to tear the country apart before the ink was even dry on the Constitution. On Lincoln's watch, it happened. If he succeeded in soldering the Union back, then he would obviously be considered as among the greatest of American presidents. On the other hand, if he failed, he would be the last president of the United States. And uh, there was really nothing in between. It had been just five days before April 14th that the Southern surrender at Appomattox marked the beginning of the end of the war. There's just the sense of this relief after four years of this incredible war. It's like the clouds are breaking, the sun is coming out. Just tell Cornelia everything is excellent. It's perfect. He has breakfast with his family, including his son Robert, who's home from the war. Tell us about your adventure with General Grant. As an aide to General Ulysses S. Grant, Robert Todd Lincoln was witness to the surrender. Ordinary transaction. You're going to see his grave site in Arlington, Robert Todd. Mary Lincoln talks about their plans to attend the theater that evening. All the Lincolns had to do was express an interest in coming, and believe me, the theater people uh, knocked themselves uh, silly getting the tickets to the White House. Because if the president is coming, you wanted to see the president, even if you didn't want to see the play. When I was born, my mother would take court. For a modern president, going to the theater constitutes a security nightmare. But Lincoln lived in a different world. He has this great thirst for human contact and relationships. And so he works hard at not isolating himself within the world of the White House. Lincoln was seemingly determined not to live in the bubble. Because even in the 19th century, there was a bubble. The evening's performance stars the British actress and director, Laura Keene. Known for her beautiful dancing girls, reviewers warned polite audiences of the hidden mysteries of alabaster bosoms and the finely shaped legs parading Ms. Keene's stage. Keene's comedy, Our American Cousin, was her signature production. But history will remember it for one tragic event. After breakfast, in his White House office, he meets with Nancy Bushrod, a newly freed woman seeking back pay for her Union soldier husband. In the fall of 63, he had issued a proclamation of amnesty and reconstruction. And what he seemed to be saying was that freed people should be educated. 
they had to become a part of american society lincoln promises mrs bushrod she will receive the lost paychecks at 11 a.m he leads a cabinet meeting everyone said lincoln seemed lighthearted that like a burden had been lifted off him by the surrender of the main confederate army Secretary of War Edwin Stanton has a seat at the cabinet table. Just days before, Lincoln refused to let him resign, pleading he needed Stanton's help through the war's final act. Assistant Secretary of State Frederick Seward is filling in for his injured father. William Seward is bedridden after a carriage accident. Seward's really Lincoln's closest confidant and advisor. So, in some sense, he's deputy president. General, I'm delighted. Fresh from the surrender, General Grant is the celebrity in the room. Lincoln invites him to the theater, but Grant and his wife are leaving town to visit their children. Very important. At 3 p.m., Lincoln meets with his vice president, Andrew Johnson. There probably couldn't be two people more opposite than Andrew Johnson and Abraham Lincoln. Johnson hated black people in general. He did not believe that black people had any rights that he had to recognize. Almost all you need to know about Andrew Johnson is that he didn't call it reconstruction. He called it restoration. But words matter. At four o'clock, Lincoln set the complicated affairs of the nation aside for a rare outing with his wife. It was unusual, maybe exceptional, that Lincoln would have asked to join his wife on our carriage ride. 